Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Long, and I'm an executive here with Cerner, and uh, welcome to our campus. Hopefully everybody has some coffee or water or uh, anything that you need. Please let us know. We want this to be a very productive event today, and uh, we're very excited and honored to uh, co-host this with the Chester County Economic Development Council and Mary Beth. Uh, it's exciting and truly an honor for us. We're, we're a, a global company of 29,000 associates around the globe and 1,800 associates employed here in Chester County. So it's important to us globally as well as locally. And we also serve about uh, 28,000 healthcare provider sites. So when you talk to our clients, talk to our associates, this topic is paramount for everybody. So I, I'm excited to see so many people here. And uh, also, I, I'd like to turn the program over to Mary Beth DiVincenzo. I'm going to introduce Mary Beth. Uh, she currently serves as the Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer with the Chester County Economic Development Council. And she's uh, been in the industry for 26 years in the public sector, private sector, um, working in community relations and also with uh, a pharmaceutical firm and has also served on a number of boards. Um, she's currently a member of the Chester County Workforce Investment Board, Penn State Great Valley Advisory Board, and also the United Way of Chester County Board of Directors. So please join me in a big welcome and uh, thank you for Mary Beth. Good morning, everyone. And thanks, Mike and Cerner, for hosting us today. This is a wonderful facility and opportunity to bring you in to see another company in Chester County, another successful company in Chester County. As Mike mentioned, my name is Mary Beth Stevensenzo, and that was a jack-of-all-trades <laughs> description of my background. I'd like to start off today by thanking our sponsors for this event. We have our gold sponsors, Jennersville Hospital and Tower Health, along with Kendall Crosslands. Our silver sponsor, Miramont Treatment Center, and our community sponsor, Phoenixville Community Health Foundation. Please join me in thanking our sponsors. So I always start off by asking the question, how many of you know anything about Chester County Economic Development Council? Okay, so about half the room, and, and so far, that's what I'm finding. So if you'll give me a minute, I'd like to uh, give you a quick overview of what the council does. So our mission is to provide smart economic growth in Chester County and our region. Pretty simple. And how do we do that? We have a team of about 33 folks. There's our Brady Bunch picture. We were established in 1960, so we're coming up on our 60th anniversary. We are a private, nonprofit, non-governmental agency, so while we partner very closely with our county folks, we are not a part of county government. And uh, what I'd like to ask now is those of you that are here from our team, could you raise your hand? And if you look around, I'm going to describe some of our services. Please feel free to ask anyone uh, if you need help in any of these areas. So what are our services? If our CEO were here right now, he would tell you we do three things for businesses and organizations. First is financing solutions. We have an, a, a group within our organization that provides small business lending, tax-exempt financing, low-interest loans, grants, and tax credit help. The second thing every company needs is their building or their site. So we have a group that works. If you want to be in Chester County and you're currently outside, we can help you locate here. If you want to expand your building or build a new building, we can help you with that as well. The third thing, and I would argue most important, are your people or your workforce. We are fortunate in that we have a very large group of about 14 uh, folks who are working on workforce development. Excuse me. Um, in that area, we have what are called industry partnerships, and we're going to, I'll mention that in a few seconds because that's critical to today's event, industry partnerships bringing like organizations together and trying to address and solve their common needs and challenges. 
do a host of STEM or youth initiatives where we're trying to prepare students for your businesses. And then a, a lot of work with hiring and recruiting. With an unemployment rate hovering around 3% in this area and the region, it's pretty tough for all of our companies to find talent or make the best connections of talent. I will mention that there are plenty of folks out there. Making those connections is absolutely critical. So I mentioned about the industry partnerships. Chester County is home to um, about eight high priority clusters of industry groups. And for our purposes, there are five that we manage formally, one in agriculture, one in um, advanced manufacturing, one in IT and communications, and one in energy or alternative energies. The fifth one is in healthcare, which brings us to today's event. In each of these industry groups, I mentioned we try to bring like companies together, take a look at what your common challenges or your common needs are, and then pool the resources of all of our partners, whether it's the county's workforce development board, whether it is the state's resources, any resource that's available to help your company meet those challenges or those needs. So if we look at the Healthcare Connect, that is a group that's been in operation since 1998. But back in the fall, um, we had a group of health, senior healthcare executives meet. We call them our healthcare innovators. If you're a healthcare innovator, could you raise your hand, please? So many of these folks put together today's event. But they identified back in the fall, along with our Healthcare Connect board, that the number one issue facing not only healthcare organizations, but all of our industries are the challenges around behavioral health and addiction, which is why we're all here today, to take a look at not only the impacts to individuals, but the impacts and possible solutions for our companies. So we're thrilled to have you all here today. Healthcare Connect, I wanted to point out as Kathy, Kathy Emick, stand up, because. I want to make sure everybody sees Kathy Emick in the back and Claire Mooney up front here. They're the co-chairs of Healthcare Connect and would love to speak to you about ongoing efforts within the industry. So please take a moment when you're done with today's event to touch base with either Claire or Kathy about the efforts of the Healthcare Connect. So with that, thank you for indulging me to talk about the council. Let's get started with our event for this morning. I'd like to turn it over and introduce Claire Mooney to our group. Claire is currently the President and Chief Executive Officer for Jennersville Hospital, again, part of Tower Health. Claire is passionate and, and is described as a change agent. I can assure you she is. She has come in along with Kathy Emick and our team and really put some uh, action and energy into working on behalf of the healthcare industry in Chester County and the region. She has held progressive positions in both the clinical and administrative side of the house. Um, she has been involved with the academic as well as the teaching systems within the hospitals and healthcare systems. So I am thrilled to introduce Claire Mooney today to all of you. She's going to be our moderator for the event. Claire? Thank you, Mary Beth. We are so excited to have you here with us today. Our program, Drug Addiction and Mental Health in the Workplace, Truth and Solutions, most of this work was part of my doctoral dissertation where we looked at really how people become addicted, why they can't get off medication, and how we can utilize technology to help this cause. Today, our format, we will be featuring several presentations that will be first from the DA's office, Second, we will have Michael Duncan, President and CEO of Chester County Hospital. Then we will have a break around 10 o'clock. When we come back, we'll hear from Kim Bowman, the Director of Chester County Human Services, followed by Tom Kane, the President and CEO of Miramont Mainline Health. After which, we will have a panel discussion where we'll be asking questions of the group. 
and then we'll be turning it over to the audience. So I look forward to your questions, and then at the end we'll be also be hearing from um, Sean Rohrer, who has been both an employer who will be talking about the peer aspects of this epidemic. I'm pleased to announce that we have with us today Commissioner Michelle Kitchline. Michelle Harris Kitchline is the chair of the Chester County Board of County Commissioners. Commissioner Ch Kitchline was selected by her fellow commissioners to co-chair VISTA 2025, Chester County's public and private economic development initiative for Chester County. She is the chair of the Taxation and Assessment Committee of the Chester County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania and is the secretary of the Chester County Historical Society. Commissioner Kitchline also serves Chester County on the Delaware Valley Planning Commission, the Transportation Management Association, Chester County, and the Westchester Business Improvement District. She is also on the nominating committee for the Chester County Council BSA. In her role as the county commissioner, she is additionally an ex officio member of the Chester County Conservative Conservation District, a board member of Uptown Performing Arts Center, and has been appointed regional advisor committee to FEMA. Furthermore, she has recently joined Stop the Violence, against women coordinating team to ensure safe workplace for all residents in Chester County. Please welcome Michelle Kitchline. Thank you, after hearing that I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, I'm also a mom, so uh, I really am exhausted. Um, Anyway, this is uh, a great event. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, Chester County really has been at uh, the forefront of a lot of health initiatives, and uh, one of the things that um, the county commissioners are very dedicated to is uh, the prevention of addiction in, in Chester County. And I'm honored to stand here to introduce your next speakers because we have teamed very closely. This is, you know, addiction is a multi approach. It's not just health, it's also law enforcement, um, it's also counseling. You know, the, the, um, what we've been doing in our health department and our drug and alcohol department is working very hard on um, recovery uh, because you can, uh, obviously you can save folks, but if you don't set them on the right path towards recovery, um, it's just a save. Uh, they go right back to, you know, their behaviors. And one of the things I'm sure as a business community that we've all tracked is the impact on, uh, on businesses. I mean, it's lost workers, lost productivity, lost future workforce. Um, but uh, I'm here to introduce our next speakers. We'll talk a little bit about the um, law enforcement side of this and the impact um, that they've uh, really had on uh, Chester County. Um, I think we have a unique uh, law enforcement team um, in the DA's office. They're looking at this very differently, and I would say much more successfully than a lot of counties, uh, not just in the southeast region, but um, in Pennsylvania. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Tom Hogan and Chuck Gaza. Uh, first, Tom Hogan is our district attorney. He's the chief law enforcement officer in Chester County. He previously served as a federal prosecutor for the United States uh, Department of Justice, where he prosecuted violent crime, drug trafficking organizations, political corruption, and terrorism. Uh, in addition uh, to serving with the Department of Justice, Mr. Hogan was an assistant district attorney in Chester County and was a partner in um, our, one of our largest law firms uh, in uh, Chester County. And uh, Mr. Hogan received his undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College. I forgive you, Tom, for that as a Penn graduate. <laughs> and his law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law. Uh, during his tenure as district attorney, Mr. Hogan has received awards for his work in the areas of homicide and domestic violence. And um, also, on a, a personal note, Tom served as my solicitor when I was chair of the Board of Supervisors in Tredifferent, so he does do local things as well. Um, and I'll also introduce uh, Chuck Gaza, because unfortunately I have to leave to conduct our public meeting. Him, I guess you won't be there. Um, so uh, Chuck Gaza is the Chief of Staff of the Chester County District Attorney's Office. In other words, he runs Tom. 
Um, Mr. Gaza previously served in the United States Army Reserve. In addition to serving with the Army Reserve, Mr. Gaza served as the Chief of Military Justice for the 6th uh, Air Refueling Wing and as a Special Assistant uh, United States Attorney for the Department of Justice. Uh, the Area Defense Council for the Air Force Legal Services Agency in Washington, D.C., an Assistant District Attorney in Chester County and a solo practitioner in Kennett Square until he returned to the District Attorney's Office in 2012. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree from Penn State University and his law degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. And during his tenure as Chief of Staff, Mr. Gaza handles the daily management of major case investigations, supervising the special prosecution units and acting as the liaison between the DA's office and the 46 municipal and state police departments in Chester County. So now you know why I feel safe when I go to bed at night. So uh, I'll turn it over, I guess, Mr. Hogan. Is that first? So the economic impact of overdosing and using, in a word, catastrophic, all right? We have lost over 500,000 people in the last 15 years to drug overdoses. That's more than the casualties in World War I for the United States. That's more than the casualties in World War II for the United States. There's only one war that had that many casualties, and that was the Civil War when we were fighting each other. That is how big an impact this has been just with deaths, all right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about raw numbers for the economic impact. Then we're going to talk about how we got there, what happened historically to drive us into that economic impact. And then we'll talk about what are we doing here in Chester County, the third thing, to blunt that impact. Because I got to tell you, we have turned this ship around here in this county. Now, there's some bad news at the end of that, but we have turned this ship around, and we are one of the only counties that currently is driving everything down. Overdose deaths, prescriptions, pills for prescription, all coming down in Chester County. All right? All right, so let's start right off with what's killing people. Everyone thinks guns, right? On the front page all the time, not a real gun. I did once walk into a school to do a presentation like this with a real gun just because I had that gun on me. But guns, that's what you think. Or you think cars. And historically, this has been what has killed the most people in the United States. For 40 or 50 years, if you asked what's killing the most people in the United States, the answer was cars. That only changed two years ago. All right, because the answer now is overdose deaths. Overdose deaths are the number one cause of deaths in the United States. Number one. So for 50 years, it's cars. Now all of a sudden, it's overdose deaths. If you are raising kids right now, that is your number one concern. That is how they are most likely to die. Not the gun, not the cars, but this. This little bottle right here. Because it's not illegal drugs that's killing the most people. It is prescription drugs. Everyone thinks overdoses must be cocaine, must be heroin, must be meth. It's not. Prescription drugs have overtaken illegal drugs in killing people. All right, now let's see if we can break that down into pure economics. What impact has that had on our economy, 
in the United States and across the globe. All right, let's focus first just on a one-year shot. So one year, 2015, over 900,000 people out of the workforce because of opioids. So almost a million people totally knocked out of the workforce because of opioids. Just not there. That's just one year. And they're in the prime age range, 25 to 54, which is the prime working years which as I look at that, I'm getting a little bit nervous because I'm getting pretty close to the end of that prime age range. But, so you've got your prime age range of workers and they've been knocked out. They're just not there. Let's look at a bigger picture. Nineteen ninety-nine to 2015. 12.1 billion hours of lost time in the workplace. Think about that. 12.1 billion hours of lost work time because of opioids. What could you do with 12.1 billion hours? You could probably build the pyramids over again. That is a huge chunk of money out of the workplace. How much in terms of dollars? Good thing my gun works faster than this clicker. Man, I'd be dead over and over again. All right. In terms of dollars, 0.2% per year in economic growth cut off the top from that time frame, 1999 to 2015. How much is that in dollars? $702 billion cut out of our economy by opioids. That is a humongous impact. That's not even counting how it's affecting mortality rates. You know, for the first time in U.S. history, the mortality rate, the average age at death, is going down because of opioids. You would think that we would just keep going up. Better health care, better eating, better exercise. It's not. It's going down, and it's going down particularly in the white upper and middle class because of opioids. All right, $702.1 billion knocked out of the industry. Those are huge numbers, and what that doesn't encompass is that doesn't encompass accidents. That doesn't encompass people who are driving cars that crash into people, people who are on trains who crash into things, people who are driving trucks in the workplace who crash into things because they're on opioids. All right, so we cannot overstate the economic impact in terms of dollars, in terms of hours of work lost, and in terms of people who are just not working because of opioids. Now, how do we get here? Chuck, oh, all yours. Thanks, Tom. He's not kidding about the clicker. So uh, let's talk about the size and the scope of the problem. Pennsylvania now ranks fourth nationally in drug-related deaths per 100,000 people. And in case you're wondering, uh, the number one state is obviously West Virginia, followed closely up behind uh, by Ohio and then the District of Columbia. Uh, we have 37.9 deaths per 100,000 people, and we had 5,443 deaths uh, in, the la in the 12 months of 2017. So what does that look like numbers-wise? Um, and the number of pills that are being prescribed. In 2016, 6.2 billion Vicodin pills were prescribed in the United States. 5 billion oxycodone tablets or Percocets. That's 11.2 billion opioids that were prescribed. Now, if you take that number and you divide it by the number of prescriptions in 2016, which is 236 million prescriptions, comes out to 47.5 pills per prescription. If you think about one every six hours for the average 10-day prescription, that's 40 pills. That's generally right where the average falls. Obviously, you have some people on pain management who get more, some people who only get three days' worth because of a, a root canal or what have you get less. But the average is 47 pills per prescription, 236 million prescriptions.
Now, if you look at when, uh, in 1998, uh, shortly after oxycodone started coming onto the market and being prescribed, in 1998, 11.5 tons of opioids were prescribed that year. In 2013, that number went up to 138 tons. That's the amount of drugs being put out into the market. 90% of that consumption was right here in the United States. So that's the worldwide numbers, 138 tons, 90% here in the United States. That's where this problem came from. That pill bottle that Tom showed you earlier is the problem that causes the heroin use, the overdose deaths. People use, say you get 40 pills, people use five of those pills. You have 35 pills sitting in your drug cabinet, uh, your medicine cabinet at home. More often than not, what I tell parents when I go out to high schools, you are most likely to become your child's first drug dealer. Maybe inadvertent, it may be unknown to you, but if you keep those 35 pills sitting in your medicine cabinet at about $40 a pill, think of, do that math, it's about $1,200 worth of pills sitting in your cabinet. Your child start, you know, takes, gets a, a, a sports injury, ankle, knee, shoulder, what have you. They have surgery, they get 40 pills, they've been on that for 10 days, they need a little bit more, they're now an addict. Being on the pill for 40 days, every six hours, by the end of that, physical addiction and psychological addiction start to happen. They start to get sick, they confuse the sickness with pain, they keep using the pills, they get another prescription, then they're using the pills out of your cabinet, then they're taking the pills out of grandma's cabinet, now they're on the street buying the pills. Demand. 70% of the population, 323 million in 2016, 230 million of those um, people were uh, on a prescription. Now, what are um, the prescriptions, the top three? Antibiotics, uh, and we've been hearing about this in medicine, the overprescription of antibiotics. Antidepressants for mental health issues. But number three, opioids, pain relief. Pain was being used as a symptom. And pain was being treated as a symptom by doctors for the longest time. And we're starting to see that that uptick in prescriptions now that uh, medical schools are teaching more with opioids, now that medical uh, doctors are being much more conscious about the scripts and seeing the downside of prescribing opioids the way they have been over the last 15 years, we're starting to see that number drop. But number three, as far as the total number of prescriptions, are opioids. And now I'll turn it back over to Tom for the problem. All right. Although while we're back there on uh, on. I want you to think back to when you were in fifth grade. When you were in fifth grade, if we would have asked, how many kids in this fifth grade are on a prescription drug? At least when I was growing up, the answer would have been none. Maybe one was a very identifiable issue. You go to a fifth grade class now and say, how many kids in here are on prescription drugs? What do you think the percentage is? It's high. Depends actually socioeconomically where you are. The poorer you are, the less likely they are to be on some type of prescription drugs. The richer you are, the more likely they are. So it'll be 50, 60 percent in Chester County. So it's a little bit shocking. We have normalized prescriptions to such an extent that everybody thinks that anything that is prescribed is okay. And that's part of the problem. But let's talk about how we go from being an opioid user to a heroin addict. Uh, let me have a volunteer from the crowd, somebody young. You, you're young. Come on up here. <laughs> You've got everything going for you. You're young. Step on up. You don't even need to see Exactly. It. That's how we know how young she is. <laughs> All right. So, you injure your shoulder. What's your name? Maureen. Maureen. All right. Obviously, you're the redhead Maureen. I get it. All right. So, Maureen injures her shoulder. Um, and she tears her labrum and her rotator cuff. Anybody ever do that? All right, really painful surgery. I had to have it done. They give you your prescription for it. And you are on oxycodone for maybe All right, Chuck, I'm just, going to give, I'm just going to tell you when to do it. That's what your chief of staff is for. Everybody knows your chief of staff does things. Once again, managing the boss. Exactly. All right, give me the next one. All right, so you're on oxycodone. For that surgery, you're actually going to be on it for between a month and three months. It really does hurt that much. All right? 
Now, at the end of that three months, we put this into a 17-year-old athlete. And what do you think happens when we pull that away from you? Uh, detoxing. Detoxing. You are, if you are unfortunate enough to be one of those people who is genetically set up to become addicted, you are going to be addicted. After three months on oxycodone, you're addicted and you're in big trouble. All right? A lot of times we can slowly peel it back and make you better, but sometimes we can't. Now, at the end of that 30, at the end of that three months, when your doc pulls the prescription, you've got to go to the street. And on the street, it's about $30 per pill for you to get. You're on 10 pills a day. All right? That's $300 a day. You're 17 years old. How are you going to get $300 a day? Uh, stealing from parents, stealing from anyone I can. <laughs> That's right. We always tell parents of teenagers, if you are looking around and you are noticing money that is disappearing or electronics that are disappearing and your child was on prescription drugs, well, guess what? They are now an addict. They are stealing from you because where else do you get 300 bucks a day? Well, this is where we make the switch because after a while, you can't make the $300 a day. One of your friends has the bright idea of let's switch you instead of $30 a pill to $5 a bag for heroin. So now, instead of 10 pills a day, you're on 10 bags a day. And you're spending 50 bucks a day. But what's the problem with heroin for you? Uh, it's probably laced with other drugs, including fentanyl. Laced with fentanyl, likely to kill you right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, I still don't have any money because I'm spending $50 a day on drugs. <laughs> and you're standing next to the DA. What else? Right. <laughs> getting arrested. It's illegal. Yes. Right? If you get in trouble for it, you could end up right. getting arrested for it. We've got all of these problems. That is how we go from a perfectly respectable teenage athlete to all of a sudden, boom, a heroin addict on the street, stealing, doing whatever they can, potentially being arrested, and potentially dying because of fentanyl. All right? I'm sorry we killed you off. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And our biggest problem with this heroin, of course, is we live right next to Philadelphia, the purest and cheapest heroin in the United States, always has been. I could take all of you in a bus down to Kensington right now, dressed just the way you are. We could get out of the buses and we could buy all the heroin we wanted. That is a big problem. And that's a problem on our doorstep that is not going away. All of the other counties have overdose task forces, and we'll talk about that, except for Philadelphia. All of the other counties are working really hard to stamp out this problem, except for Philadelphia. All right? Their response is, let's set up a safe injection site. Not going to work. Only going to cause worse problems. There are other solutions out there, and we'll talk about some of them. But Philadelphia being in our backyard is a huge problem. All right, heroin spikes. This is not the first time we've had this problem. Heroin's always been there. 1970s, we had a huge problem with heroin. Why? Vietnam, exactly right. We spent, sent hundreds of thousands of young men over to Vietnam, and heroin was coming out of Southeast Asia at the time. So the heroin spike ended in the 70s when Vietnam ended, when we pulled everyone else out. Unfortunately, we had established supply lines at that point between Southeast Asia and the United States. 1990s, what fueled heroin in the 1990s? Anybody want to take a guess? Think of what the models looked like in the 90s. Heroin chic, you remember that? Remember Pulp Fiction, that cool scene with John Travolta shooting up his heroin? All right? It was fashion-driven. It was a social phenomenon. But you could only shoot up heroin at the time. So what stopped the heroin overdoses? What stopped the heroin use? HIV. Everyone got scared to death they were going to get HIV. Magic Johnson came out and said, I have AIDS. And everyone said, if we're shooting up, I'm out. 2010s, we're in another spike. It's caused by the opioid prescribing process, all right? You saw what Chuck presented to you in the number of pills prescribed and that huge spike. So that's how we got into the spike that we're dealing with right now, and we are coming out of it. So what's going on here in Chester County? Chuck, take it over. So, look. 
So looking at the numbers, uh, in 2015, we had 74 overdose deaths. 2016, that number jumped to 106. 2017, 144. That's 2.7 deaths per week in Chester County alone. Now multiply that times 67 counties, times 50 states, and you start to see the scope of the numbers of the people that we were dealing with. 2018, we dropped down to 111. Uh, and then this year, so far, I think we've had 25. I think it's the number that we're looking at. So we're actually on pace to have less this year than we did last year than we did the year before. Um, so that's, that is a bright spot, at least in the news. Uh, if you look at the 2016, a snapshot year of the overdose deaths in southeastern Pennsylvania, you'll see that Chester County has the least number of deaths in the southeast region. Then we go up to Bucks, Delaware County, uh, obviously with Chester, Montgomery County, with Norristown, also having direct access to Philadelphia being co-located with Philadelphia. Um, actually having you know, those counties between us and Philadelphia is one of the things that have helped keep our numbers down. Um, in addition to all the work that the opioid task force, that the commissioners and that the DA's office and the police departments are doing. Philadelphia, 900. Tom talking about you know, the approach that Philadelphia has taken to the heroin and opioid crisis. The numbers, you know, obviously they have a lot more people. A lot of the people are coming in from the uh, collar counties into Philadelphia to buy the drugs use the drugs there, but the numbers uh, are astounding in Philadelphia, and those numbers are still climbing. Uh, one of the things Maureen had mentioned, fentanyl. Fentanyl is the new addition to the opioid crisis, to the heroin crisis that we're dealing with. If you've ever seen, there's a visual of how much heroin it takes, and they use a salt shaker, how much heroin it takes to overdose. And it's a, it's a decent amount in the, little, in the bottom of the uh, shaker. But then you look at fentanyl and it's three grains, three grains of salt. That level of fentanyl is enough to cause an overdose in a person. And now there's even something out there called carfentanyl, which is even more. That's one grain. One grain is enough to cause an overdose in somebody. That's how powerful these synthetic opioids are. It's easier and cheaper to produce because it's not made from poppies. You don't have the agricultural component. You don't have the weather. You don't have the harvesting. It's all chemical. Uh, the counterfeit pills. Um, are flooding the U.S. market. They're coming up um, from the south. They actually have, they're pressing fentanyl into pills now. They actually have commercial grade pill presses that they are pumping these out to look like oxycodone, but they're actually fentanyl. 95% of Pennsylvania counties uh, at the time that we did this slide, I think probably two years ago, now it would be 100%. Fentanyl is everywhere. Fentanyl is being used in everything, whether it's being used in heroin, whether it's being used with cocaine, whether it's being used with meth. All the drug dealers, are cutting everything with everything else. If you buy a bag of heroin now, not only is it heroin, it probably has fentanyl in it more than likely than not, and it also has meth or cocaine in it, because the drug dealers are trying to keep people from overdosing. So they're cutting the heroin and fentanyl with methamphetamine to try to keep people from going into an overdose. But what you're getting is this massive cocktail, and this bag is different than this bag is different than this bag. So it's potluck which one you're shooting up with. You could have more fentanyl immediately causing an overdose, you could have meth, you could have everything. Right now, 72% of our uh, deaths in 2017 uh, were fentanyl-related. The heroin or the meth or whatever they were using had fentanyl in it, compared to only 43% the year before. That's the prevalence of fentanyl. It's, it's definitely infiltrated the market, and it's being used on a regular basis. All right, what are we doing to stop it here in Chester County? Why have we been successful where most of the rest of the United States has still been a problem? First. We have a Chester County Overdose Prevention Task Force. This is not just a law enforcement problem. We can't just arrest our way out of it. We need it to pair with doctors, treatment professionals. Um, you'll hear from Kim Bowman um, in a second, uh, in our Health and Human Services and Health Department. We had to put everyone together. And so we have over 50 different organizations and agencies working together to figure out what works best. And we have a saying, if it's stupid and it works, it ain't stupid. So we'll try just about anything to cut down on the opioid overdoses and the opioid problem. We've come up with some pretty unique solutions and we're still working on them. But I'll give you a couple of them that we've come up with here. There, I could go on for hours about them, but I'll give you a couple that work best so you can see what is working. Drop backwards one. Arrest and incarcerate. You can't forget arrest and incarcerate, all right? You have to lock up drug dealers for them to understand that it is risky for them to peddle their poison. 
I heard a wire that we did in Chester County of a guy from Philly saying, I'm not coming out there because if I get caught out there, I'm going to state prison. If they catch me here in Philly, I'm getting probation. And then he said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll come out there, but it'll cost you twice as much. And he showed up with a log of heroin and sold it to one of our undercover officers, and we snatched him up, and he said, I knew it. I shouldn't have come out here. And he went to state prison. You've got to arrest and incarcerate. You also have to arrest bad doctors. We don't have many of these out here in Chester County. There are pill mills in Philly that will churn out these prescriptions with no problem, and you've got to stop those folks as well. Um, so both the, the hardcore drug dealer and your bad docs have to be stopped. I'm happy to say here in Chester County, we don't have many. And in Chester County, our docs were one of the first to understand that opioid, the epidemic, started with the prescriptions and started cutting them back. So they did a great job. Next. Like I said, simple, stupid, but it works. Prescription drug drop boxes. We put them in, poli in police departments across Chester County. And as Chuck said, all these leftover prescriptions that were in medicine cabinets and kids were grabbing them and were using them, let's say, we said, let's just get them off the street. We'll just set up these secure boxes in police departments. People can come in and drop them off. We expected there'd be a big rush for the first uh, couple years, 1,300 pounds the first year, 2,900 pounds the second year. We expected it to level off. It didn't. 8,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. In the last five years, we have collected over 32,000 pounds of prescription drugs. Those are drugs that are not on the street being sold. Those are drugs that are not going into the water table. Because if you actually checked your water, you would have found that there were noticeable levels, detectable levels of prescription drugs in your water out of your tap. All of this is a problem, a simple solution, prescription drug drop boxes. The Narcan law, this was a big one. Delaware County and us came up with the idea that we would have this Narcan, which is an opioid antagonist, available to law enforcement. When you make a 911 call before the EMTs get there, cops get there. So we put Narcan in their hands. This just goes up, somebody who's overdosing knows, they hit the plunger, and then the person comes back to life. All right, how important has that been in Chester County? where, by the way, every police department carries Narcan. Since 2014, there have been 430 uses, 417 saves. That's 417 people whose lives were saved who otherwise would have been in the overdose death category. If it's simple and it works, then we use it. I know some people say, why are we saving these overdose? Why are we saving these addicts' life? Because they might turn out okay. They might become a productive member of society. And when it happens to your next door neighbor's kid, like it happened to mine, you think it's a good idea. All right, next. Drug court. We have our public defender here, the chief of first assistant, Nathan Shanker. Drug court is extraordinarily important. We have the, one of the oldest drug courts in Pennsylvania. You're an addict, you get caught with drugs in Chester County. You go into drug court. You have that option. You stay clean. It's a year or two program, very intensive. You come out, your charges go away. All right? Very effective. Very intensive. Very expensive. Yes, but absolutely worth it to keep people clean. And prescriptions. Like I said, getting to the doctors was incredibly important because the doctors were taught, first, that opioids were not addictive. Can you imagine that? In the 90s, that was the belief. That was what went around, that opioids were not addictive. Second, that doctors, you need to treat pain, and opioids do a good job of treating pain. How many of you in here have ever been on an opioid? I know I have, athletic injuries, all right? They do, they treat pain, they knock it out. And the training that doctors had back when the opioids first became popular, they had a half an hour in medical school. So you put those three things together, that's what led to the opioids being prescribed so much. So when we got to our doctors, we said, you need to cut this down. So they did. 
There are now prescription drug monitoring databases where they check to see if you are going to multiple doctors for multiple prescriptions. And that has cut down the number of prescriptions going out. They check to see what other drugs you're on. That has cut down the number of drugs you're going out. And then our docs have cut down the number of people they are prescribing to. And they have cut down the number of pills per prescription. They're trying to cut out the wisdom teeth and the sprained ankles. I have seen studies seeing how many people became addicted as a result of being prescribed opioids for a sprained ankle or for wisdom teeth getting pulled out. That's unbelievable to me. I sprained my ankles plenty of times. I had my wisdom teeth out. They put ice on it, gave me an aspirin, and told me, hopefully, it'll go away in a little while. So these are just a few of the things that we've done. Here in Chester County, we have actually turned this around. As Chuck said, the overdose numbers are coming down. Our doctors are on board. Law enforcement is working with all the different agencies. We actually are getting there. So this is one of the first places in the country that can say that. But I'm going to leave you with one piece of bad news because the Mexican cartels in the last year have turned around, realized that their business model of opioids and heroin is slowly petering out, and they have turned around and they are starting to jack methamphetamine, crystal meth, into the system. So we are going to see a lot more crystal meth. You'll actually see me on TV tomorrow talking about it, about a bust, so get ready for that, because whereas opioids make you just sort of short out, crystal meth makes you delusional, aggressive, and is a whole other channel for everybody sitting in this room. So thank you all. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next, we have Michael Duncan, President and Chief Executive Officer of Chester County Hospital, which is going to give his perspective as both an employer and a parent. Good morning. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to uh, ground zero. I'm going to deal with the stigma issue and talk about my family. Uh, talk to you as a father and give you uh, just a little bit of our journey um, as both a father and, and an insider. Uh, I've, I've run uh, managed care organization, so I've been on the payer side of this issue. Uh, I've run large academic physician groups, so I've been on the physician side of the issue, and I've run a couple of hospitals, so I've seen it from the hospital side. Um, I do have to say, none of that makes me an expert. Uh, I, I'm sort of like the Forrest Gump of healthcare. I, I don't know much, but I keep popping up in interesting places. And so uh, these are just observations. Uh, we have other trained professionals that are going to talk to us today who can help us more specifically. But I'll go back um, maybe a dozen years ago and a typical phone call with my oldest son would uh, be 515, 520 in the morning and uh, he'd say, Dad, I, my brain's on fire and I'm afraid to get out of bed. And so I'd say, all right, buddy. Well, I'm glad you called, and I want you to know uh, you're not alone, and we'll get through this together. So why don't you tell me what it is you're fearful about? And so he'd have something that wouldn't make you and me fearful, but he was completely absorbed by it. So I just say, all right, look, um, well, I know you can roll out of bed and get to the shower, so why don't you go take a hot shower, and call me back when you're done. And that's how we would get through the day. We would just take the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and, um, and he would make it through his day. Somewhere along the way, uh, he discovered that he could put the fire in his brain out with a six-pack. Now, that sounds pretty logical to me. If your brain is on fire, and you can drink a six-pack, and you feel normal again. And that would have been a good plan if the six-pack didn't turn into a case. And so he started with mental illness, and he ended up with uh, being an alcoholic. And if, he, if it was a fairly passive thing, that might have been all right, but uh, I don't know what the technical term is, but he has walking blackouts. So he's still functioning, but his rational systems 
not working, and a lot of bad things happened. So he resisted treatment of any kind, except for beer. Um, and finally, one uh, I remember one Monday, tremendous relief. He had agreed to go in patient for care, so we drove him to a dual diagnosis um, care provider. And uh, we got home at the end of the day, and my wife and I just felt this tremendous sense of relief. He's in a safe place. He's going to get the care he needs. And um, so that was new for us. And then three days later, uh, my wife called me at work, and she said, our younger son is home early from work because he wants to kill himself. So, oh, my go, take him to... Um, a psych ED in Manhattan where we were at the time, admitted him to the hospital. And I remember that next morning we were there through the night, uh, walking out on the streets of Manhattan with my head spinning, uh, never having thought as a dad that I'd have both of my kids in a psych hospital ever, but at the same time. So that, uh, that began a journey of trying to find uh, what what would work for them. And we, we have a tendency to say the mental health and substance abuse system is broken. I think that gives us too much credit. That, that implies that it ever worked. And there, there isn't a mental health and substance abuse system. Um, and I'm on the provider side of this, so I'm, I'm, I'm critiquing us. I'm not critiquing someone else. If you show up in my emergency room uh, because your blood pressure is high or because you've, your heart's skipping a beat, you've got to pass. It's within minutes, we're going to walk down a protocol. We know what tests to run. We know what to do when you get a variety of different results. We know how to treat that. And you're going to work your way. Maybe you work your way to the cath lab and then to the ORs. We know what we're going to do. We can tell the patient and the family, here's the path. You show up in our emergency room with a mental health crisis, it's just a completely different thing. We're, we're in disposition mode. We're not in, uh, we, there's no dipstick for the brain. There isn't a test to run to say, okay, your serotonin level's three and it needs to be 12. We're going to give you this medicine and we're going to monitor your serotonin until it gets to 12. The, the, uh, Lack of really great research in mental health and substance abuse keeps us from being as effective as we could be. And it's because the brain is a harder thing to study. And as a result, the number of times I've been in a provider's office saying, okay, well, try this medicine, try that medicine, let's change the dose, let's change the provider. Um, you might want to try this, you might want to try that. The, the primary care provider for my boy's mental illness is me, dad, not hospital CEO. It's dad. And uh, we tried everything we can think of. Now, fortunately, we found something that works for one of them, and it was ECT. Uh, he was uh, often suicidal, a number of attempts, and after about 50 electroshock therapy sessions, he became the boy he was 20 years ago. Happy, productive, functioning, brain working. The problem with people that have mental illness is the very organ they need to deal with their issue is the one that doesn't work, their brain. So the family has to come alongside. The employer has to come alongside. If we're going to make progress in this, we've got to get comfortable with the fact that it exists, that it's getting worse, I've heard two different statistics on the number of, uh, of adolescents with suicidal behavior or ideation. Uh, one said it's grown 75% in the last eight years, and the other one said 250%. Average them, use the low one, I don't care. It's a crisis. Um, and what are the solutions? Well, if we turned all social media off, that would be a, a good start. <laughs> Uh, we got to do a lot more research on what's going on in the brain and find uh, uh, things that are efficacious. And just back to the lack of evidence-based 
care and pathways and processes that the rest of the med surge enjoys. Uh, when, when we started doing electroshock therapy and going to a great um, doc at Penn, and so I'm, I'm actually an engineer by training, so I like to know what, why something works, why we're doing what we're doing. Electroshock therapy, you didn't know why it works. It was discovered by a neurologist in uh, Italy who was trying it to treat a patient with epilepsy. It didn't help his epilepsy, but he realized he was a lot happier after he had electroshock therapy. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, if, if you read the typical antidepressants, go to the physician's desk reference and read uh, how, why it works. There's some fancy words there that basically translated into my language is Shazam Gomer, we don't have a clue. That, that there is, it, it's, you know, I, I went to my doctor uh, three years ago. He said, you got high blood pressure. Uh, you can do one of two things. You can lose 20 pounds or you can take this pill. I said, give me the prescription. And, and then it was, uh, take two and a half milligrams, measure your blood pressure. Let's do that for a few days. If that's not moving it, take five, then take seven and a half, then take ten. And it's just crystal clear. There's a nice path. You know why the drug works. We know the process to deal with the disease. I don't have high blood pressure anymore. I did lose a little weight, but I'm going to count on the pills. So uh, what do we do about all this? I'm not sure, but this is a great start. Um, there isn't a system, but there are a lot of fine people doing their very best to deal with this problem in one way or another. The county has got assets. Each of us provider systems have got assets. There are a lot of not-for-profits in our community that, that have an aspect of this. And I think we need to map out who's doing what, what are the gaps, and then how can we across the county, just as we heard a lot of people had to come together to turn the tide on opioids. How can we come together, fill some of those gaps so that people who have mental illness uh, can get the care that they need? And I would just tell you, uh, too, so I was telling my wife this morning that I'd be here talking about this, and she said, please tell them, don't ever give up. Just don't give up. You just have to stay after it. Uh, I, I decided, both of my boys, there were times when if I had done what I was thinking, uh, the DA would have put me in jail. Uh, it's bizarre behavior. I mean, one of them at one point was living in a shack in the Carolinas, and he had this epiphany that uh, he liked being outside, so he went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of blue paint and painted the entire inside of this house blue. Pretty rational. It looks like the sky. So they do things that their brains tell them are rational, but they're bizarre. Don't give up on them. Don't let them isolate. For most mental illness, the tendency is for the individual to withdraw. They don't know how to process the interpersonal stuff. Don't let them do that. And so for me, I know I am the connection between my boys and reality. And uh, I've, I am not letting go. And we're making some progress. We're finding some things. We're, they're both uh, great, great guys when they don't have a psychotic break. Uh, they're both quite functional, hard workers, good contributors. Um, but a lot of that is because we didn't give up. And I'll just give you one, uh, one quick spiritual background, but don't worry about it. The, everybody in here can do it, whatever your background is. If you think about that story where the young, uh, the sincere young Jewish man goes to Jesus and says, God, there's all these laws in the Old Testament. Which one's the most important? And he's, he really wants to know, what, what do I need to do? And Jesus says, oh, there's only two. Love God and love others. And when my head is spinning with my boys and I don't know what's next and I can't find a provider who can tell me what's next, I know this. Just do what love is in the moment. Just love them. And we can do that for our employees. We can do that for our peers. The impact that you can have on somebody at work who has depression or anxiety 
or bipolar disease, if they know they're not alone, if they know you're on their team and you're not giving up, we can get them treatment, they can get better, and they can make a contribution to your business or to your family. So don't give up and let's love them all. Thank you, Mike. We're going to take a short 10-minute break, and we'll be back after that with Kim Bowman. Okay. So now we're going to invite Kim Bowman, Director of Human Services, up to present. All right. I'm going to try to walk and chew gum at the same time, so... Forgive me if I fall off the stage, just I'll pick myself back up. Um, thank you very much. So as we talk about mental illness and addiction in the workplace, who are we talking about? Well, the reality is neither one of those things discriminate. It could be anybody from your senior executive management team down to the, the person you just hired um, at an entry-level wage. Next slide, please. The reality is that one in five individuals will experience mental illness or substance use disorder in their lifetime. Think about that, one in five, that's 20%, and all of those people live in families. So not only when we talk about the impact of mental illness and substance use disorders do we need to think about the individual, but we also need to think about the impact on the family because it does take a tremendous toll. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the issue looks like, kind of frame the problem, how big it is, talk about what it looks like in Chester County, and then some things that are going on and some potential resources or the impact on the workplace and then some potential resources. So the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services has a national household survey on drug use and health, and every year that's updated and somehow I lost the, the naming of that slide. But this is data from that, and as you can see, we have 46.6 million adults in the United States with a mental illness, and that could be any mental illness and it could have no impairment up to severe impairment. About 24% of that 46.6 million Americans actually have a severe mental illness that greatly impacts on their daily living and impairs that. Substance use disorder, about 18.7 million. Um, with a substance use disorder, about three, and four, three out of four of those individuals, it's actually alcohol use, about one in, I think it's eight, with drugs and one in nine for both. And then that slice in the middle, eight and a half million, that's the individuals that are actually struggling with both mental illness and co-occurring substance use disorders. That is not a small number, and that number continues to grow. Next slide, please. So here in Chester County, there's a couple of ways we look at the issue. We have a youth survey that's done every two years. All of our schools have been participating since 1997, so we have really good trend data. Um, this survey occurs in 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grades, um, and these are sort of the, the entry drugs, the things that you'll see, and you can see we have positive trends going in alcohol, positive trends going in cigarettes, marijuana is a little all over the place, and while these numbers are positive, we're actually a little higher than the state and national averages on alcohol and marijuana, so that continues to be a concern. One of the things that's important, and I really believe that prevention is going to be a critical factor in us actually dealing with these issues. The more we can prevent, the, the more... Um, the better off we're all going to be, both from a human perspective and an economic perspective. And one of the things that the research shows time and time again, and it's clear with, if you look at the cigarette numbers, use perception of risk and harm and the availability of these substances drive kids' use. The more kids believe it's not harmful, it's okay, it's safe, and the easier it is to get your hands on, the more likely it is we're going to see kid use, kids use it. Cigarettes, you see that line. If you Go back before 2007, you'd see it even higher, but it just comes straight down. If you think about the opioid epidemic, again, perception of hard, harm and availability really had an impact on the use. Next slide, please. Where we're seeing a lot of concern, though, is around some of the mental health indicators. I sit on a statewide prevention group that had the Department of Education there, and one of the things the person from education said is that every school district is calling concerned about mental health issues in the schools and how do we deal with those. When you look at that, we have about 12% that reported past year that, that within the past year they hurt themselves. Um, 
just over 10% planned suicide and around 6% that actually attempted suicide. Now, our numbers look good when you look at it compared to the state numbers, but 6% translates to 1,000 kids that took the survey. So we're talking about 1,000 kids that actually attempted suicide in the past year. That's very disturbing. Next slide, please. And this is a concern not just with our school-age youth nationally, and I'm sorry, I'll get to this. Um, based on the National Household Survey, the 18 to 25-year-old group is also seeing rising levels of major depressive disorder, suicidality, and serious mental illness. Those rates are also rising. If, when you look at suicide, second leading cause of death, women attempt suicide more frequently than men, but men are much more lethal in their attempts. Um, and we're really looking at, at the time these statistics were done, they were the highest in middle-aged white males. Next slide, please. Chester County, um, similar to the rest of the nation, we've seen our suicide rates go up. Um, obviously very disturbing. In 2018, we saw them go down a little bit. We're hoping this is the beginning of a trend and not just a blip on the screen. There's a lot of work being done. There's a very active suicide prevention coalition in Chester County that has done a lot of work. Um, there's a training called Question, Persuade, Refer, QPR, you will hear it referred to, um, that actually, it's a, it's a training for anybody to, to learn how to actually ask about suicide if you're concerned somebody's talking about it or thinking about it, and then what you can do about it on a very real basis. You don't have to be a clinician. Um, over the last year they've trained, or the last couple of years, 3,200 people, I'm sorry, yeah, in 2018, 3,200 people were trained in QPR. And one of the things that's happening between the Suicide Prevention Task Force, the intermediate unit, is they're really, they've gone in seven school districts and trained every ninth grader, with the goal being to go in and train the ninth grade every year, so within four years, all the high school kids will have re received the QPR training. One school district um, actually had all of their high school kids trained. This is a training that you can actually bring into the workplace. So as we talk about resources, that's one of the things to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Overdose deaths, Tom and Chuck gave you a really good um, under, uh, overview of what's happening with overdoses. As you can see again, 2018, our numbers are down. We're hoping that's a trend and that will continue. Next slide, please. So what does all this mean to you as an employer? The reality is there's significant impact if you have mental health, if, if someone in the workplace is struggling with a mental illness or a substance use disorder. Um, depending on the industry, there's a large number of folks that work in your, that are in your workplace that are suffering from a substance use disorder. It's approximately 7%, but depending on the industry, it can go up as high as 17%. So there's a lot of statistics on that. In the emergency room, patients that were injured or at work, 16% were under the influence at the time. There's also a significant number that if there was a uh, workplace fatality, they'd been drinking at the time of the accident. There is an economic hit here. Lost work days. Annually, 217 million work days are completely or partially lost. Um, and this is due to a lot of the indirect things. In a three-month period, patients with depression miss, miss an average of almost five days in that three-month period and have about 11 and a half days of reduced productivity. Uh, mental illness and substance use cost 80 to $100 billion a year, and you hear different figures thrown around. Um, and most of that is in indirect costs. Next slide, please. The indirect costs include lost productivity, absenteeism, illness, increased use of medical services that is then also going to drive some of your insurance rates up a little bit, injury, turnover, the training that goes with turnover, and the disability costs. Again, 70% of the costs associated with mental illness and substance use for employers is not in the treatment of those illnesses. It really is in all of these other things. The treatment, the medications are a small, small part of the overall cost. Next slide. We also have to talk about the fact that it's not just the person. And as we talk about what some of the solutions are, it's not just about the person who may have a mental illness, who may have a substance use disorder, but it's their family. Imagine going to work in the morning when you're worried about what your spouse or your child or um, your parent is going to spend their day doing, or whether when you come home they will be there or they will be um, alive or dead or you'll be getting a call from the police. It's really hard to focus on what you're doing that day, um, and it takes a lot of support. There's a lot of worry, a lot of fear. 
relationship strain, as you heard, there are no clear answers here. There really aren't. There's no absolutes about this is the answer. So when you're in a couple and you're trying to figure out the best way to respond to a challenge to, a, to the pain of your loved one, you might not agree on what those answers are. If you have a child suffering from a substance use disorder, do we support them? Do we throw them out? Do we let them sit in jail? All of those things become real challenging and difficult conversations. So that relationship strain can be there. Exhaustion. You're just tired. Guilt, shame, you know, where does that all fit into this? Frustration, anger. You can love somebody to death. That doesn't mean it doesn't become really hard. And frustration and anger with the system and other folks that may not be experiencing that same one or the systems that aren't responding and providing what you know your loved one needs. Isolation, it's really easy to talk about when you broke your arm or your child's broken limb from falling or a car accident or somebody's cancer treatment. Those conversations people have and don't think anything about. Conversations about your loved one's substance use issues or mental illness are a lot harder to have. So people, not only the individual, but people, family members can isolate or, as well or not have a safe place to feel like they can talk about those things. And financial strain. The reality is treating these issues costs a lot of money. And families can go into debt trying to respond and find the right answer for their child, for their loved one, for their spouse. Um, Co-pays, deductibles, all of those things can add up. Next slide. Treatment. Treatment doesn't happen a lot. 92% of individuals with a substance use disorder don't access care. Um, about 57% of folks with a mental illness don't. When you talk serious mental illness, we're talking about a third that don't access the care that they may need. Why is that? And there's a lot of reasons. One is the cost. Again, I can't afford it. I can't afford the copay. I can't afford the deductible. Or I don't have insurance and I can't afford it at all. The other one is they don't believe they, that it's needed. One of the issues and one of the challenges with um, diseases, particularly substance use disorder and mental illnesses, I'm not sick. If you talk to somebody with a substance use disorder, denial is a key factor in that illness. If you talk to somebody who is delusional, they don't believe that they are. And if you don't understand it, you're just not that bright. So often that's part of the challenge. Um, and there's also a sense of hopelessness. Even if I go to treatment it's, or I go to get care, it's not going to help. I may have tried it before and it didn't work out that well. So why would I put myself through that again? Or there, I, I just don't think I'm worth it. I don't think I can make a difference. I don't think it can make a difference. Um, and this is where peer support becomes really important because you see somebody who might look like you that can help you get there. The other piece is it may not be available. We struggle here in Chester County. You wouldn't think so, but we can't find psychiatrists. We can't find them in the public sector. We've actually created a fund just for recruitment and uh, retention of psychiatrists for our Medicaid program. We still can't find them. The providers still can't find them. The commercial side is having the same struggles um, for whatever the reason. And we have a workforce, particularly in this part of the, the state, where it's a very competitive market. So we have a lot of folks that, A, not as many people coming into the field, and then the turnover. And that not only impacts on sort of availability and access, but it also impacts on quality. If you have turnover in who you're seeing, that makes a, a huge difference and a problem. The other piece is stigma. We still don't talk about mental illness and substance use disorders as part of our everyday world. Again, we don't, the fact that at least one in five individuals and at least one in four families are struggling with this, we still have the shame, we still have the stigma, we still keep it hidden. And I think that's one of our greatest battles that's, um, so kudos for folks that do talk about it um, because the reality is it impacts everyone. And I would venture to say that there are very few people in this room that have not been personally impacted one way or another through friends, families, or themselves. Next slide, please. So this is, again, from the National Household Survey. This is the reasons that people didn't get treatment. The ones with the blue arrows are all around stigma. I don't want people to know. I don't want my employer to know. I don't want my neighbors to know. Um, I'm worried about my job stability if my employer finds out. That's what all of those are. And then the other ones are cost or I just don't believe I need it. 
So again, a lot of reasons people don't get the help that they need. Um, next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about some things in Chester County, and then we'll talk about some potential resources for employers. And because we recognize that this problem is getting worse, and we're really struggling with um, having the right resources and making sure we have the right resources to respond, um, we recognized that we needed to really step back from a lot of feedback that we're hearing from folks in the community hospitals. We need to step back and say, where are our strengths, where are our gaps, where are our challenges? So we're working with a consultant, um, really trying to gra gather all the data from a lot of different planning um, activities that have gone on, health needs assessments around the community hospitals, other things that have happened, to start to say, okay, where are we missing the gap? Right now we're focused on kids because it's almost two different systems for kids and adults. And from there we'll move into the adult side. We're bringing in um, key stakeholders, focus groups to start to not just look at the data but then understand the data and see what it's telling us. Um, I appreciate the fact that there's folks in this room and from the health innovators that are participating on the steering committee. Um, I think Mike and Mary Kay. Um, so from there, we're hoping to then come up with a plan. Now, one of the challenges in Chester County, and truthfully on some of the data, is that I venture, I think it's about 85% of Chester County is commercially insured or self-insured. Most people have some resources. Getting the data around those plans and that is a little bit more challenging, so part of where we're going with this is how do we find that data as well. Um, and there will be things that come out of this that we'll be able to impact directly as a county and do things about, and then there'll be things that we'll have to try to influence or advocate for um, because we may not have the direct control. Um, we hope to have this finished um, by September, so it's a pretty aggressive timeline. Next slide, and it's just a little bit more about the mapping process. So what can you do? The important stuff, why you guys are all here. What can an employer do to make a difference? Next slide. Um, First, employee assistance programs, and I think Tom's going to talk a little bit more about those. If you don't have one, I would highly suggest looking into getting one. They can be a huge benefit both for an employee who may be struggling as well as with family members to help cope with the struggle of their loved ones. Um, if you do have an employee assistance program, look at its utilization. Is anybody using it? If not, why not? You know, what is... What is the barrier? How are people being attracted to it? Do people see it as a benefit or something I get sent to when I'm in trouble? You know, there could be different things. So look at that. The other piece, as you are looking at your insurance benefits, behavioral health benefits, mental health and substance use is the easiest place sometimes it feels to um, reduce costs. It really isn't. It costs a lot in the long run. Not treating, not dealing with it costs a lot more than treating it. Um, and make sure your insurance company knows that you take the treatment of mental illness and substance use disorders very seriously. Because one of the things that can happen is it is very hard to deny setting a broken bone when there is an x-ray that you see that shows that it's actually broken. And as Mike said, there's some straightforward, here's like the steps and the protocols that happen. Mental illness and substance use disorder, those clear answers aren't there, so it's a lot easier to say, no, go fail at this first, you know, go try this first, um, before we'll actually provide what clinically may be right for you. So you want to make sure that your insurance company knows that the treatment of your employees for mental health and substance use disorders is critical to you, and you want them to have access. You want to look at their network adequacy. Is there sufficient providers? in the network that you're in the places where your employers live, where your employees live, how do they access it? If the person has to jump through 12 hoops to get care, they won't get care at all. The easiest thing there is to do is deny treatment for addiction because people don't want it anyway so, and don't believe they need it. So, and then have somebody in your, whoever does your HR stuff who can help troubleshoot for employees that are struggling, that are having a problem. Next slide, please. The other thing you do, again, knowledge, stigma, people feel uncomfortable talking about it and supporting each other um, are critical. There's a lot of different things that can happen. Mental health first aid is a training. It's first aid for mental health. And it's like any first aid program and it's meant for lay people. Um, mental health first aid training has been around. We've done a lot of them around the county. Co-ed group might, um, is available for doing that um, as well as other trainings. You can bring those in on-site, lunch and learns, those kinds of things. 
drug-free Pennsylvania, um, funded by a grant through the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, so training for employers is free. Everything from understanding substance use to a supervisory training around how do you, under, how do you identify and document substance use issues in your workplace. Um, so there's a lot of good training. Again, giving people skills and feeling more comfortable to talk to their peers, to talk to each other about these issues is a critical part of it. Chester County Department of Mental Health and Intellectual Disabilities, again, things like question, persuade, refer, again, a good lunch and learn, a benefit to your employees. Um, and then I think that's it for me. So I think there are a lot of resources, a lot of things you can do from EAPs to your insurance contracts to on-site trainings for your employers, your employees, your supervisors, your managers. Um, if there is a crisis, there's the mental health crisis line, um, veteran services, and there's even a text line now for support. So thank you. Thank you. Next we will have Tom Kane from Miramount. I couldn't have jumped up like Maureen did. It's a bum knee. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to uh, change the uh, or flip flop that. I'm going to talk about the heart of the rehab experience first and then get to EAP. And if I don't get to all the slides in the AP, um, there's resources out on the table. And we actually have Sharon O'Brien, the executive director of First Call EAP here, who I'm sure would be glad to talk to you. But uh, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on what Kim said. You know, about 10 years ago, um, I thought a lot about, you know, why, why do people relapse, right? I've been in the treatment field for 20 years and started as a counselor. And it really bothered me because we had worked 10 years to get this really dynamic, great program in place at Miramont. And I asked my clinical director, so Peg, what are we doing wrong? Like, we're, what are we missing here? And she said, it's trauma. It's all unresolved trauma. And I said, well, we need to do something about that. I, want to, I would love to tell you about our journey to where we are now and how we treat trauma at a, at a, a rehabilitation center. Not many places are doing what we're doing, um, you know, with a three-week length of stay. But we were always told when I was a counselor, don't do anything. Don't even go near that for the first year. And that came out of the AA experience, right? People, in, when, when they get in recovery, they say, well, don't get in relationships. Don't make any big decisions. Don't make any um, moves in your first year. Just don't drink and go to meetings. And that kind of seeped into treatment. And they said, oh, no, sexual abuse, physical abuse, trauma, just put that off until, until a year. And you go, okay. I'm taking away the very coping mechanism that they're using to deal with some of these things that are inside. And uh, it really never made sense. And we probably re-traumatize people a lot. Um, let, me, let me read you this, this quote. Find some of that. Among the most common underlying factors of alcoholism and addiction disorders are unresolved trauma, neglect, and loss. Ignoring these fundamental issues in treatment results in a focus on symptom control or reduction rather than addressing the actual causes of addiction and relapse. Research has shown a strong correlation between adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, of trauma, neglect, and loss in adult alcoholism and addiction. For someone reporting four or more ACEs, the result shows a 500% increase chance of developing adult alcoholism and a 4,600%, that's 4,600% increase in the chance of developing an addiction. Now, um, when you think about, well, let me briefly explain the ACE study. Um, so ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experience, Kaiser Permanente in the, in the mid-90s uh, did a study, and they brought, it's an insurance company, and they brought 17,000 people um, from their ranks and gave them a questionnaire, 10 questions. Right? All about adverse childhood experiences. Um, you know, were, you, were you ever physically abused? Were you sexually abused? Were you emotionally abused? Was there domestic violence in your home? Um, was any of your parents incarcerated? Um, you know, was there substance abuse in the home? Was there drug addiction in the home? And so out of those 10 questions, the more um, ACEs that you scored yes to, 
as you can see, the higher percentage of, of alcoholism and drug dependency and mental health issues and medical problems. And so a lot of these kids, obviously they don't know how to handle those kind of things. They don't know how to handle what's going on inside after they've, after they've experienced trauma. And, and so they go to school and they're, they're in, you know, matriculating through, uh, through school. I remember, you know, I had, I had a couple aces on my, my scorecard, right? And I remember in fifth grade, it was right here in Chester County, St. Philip and James, the good sisters of the IHM. Um, you know, on my, we had uh, comportment and academics. Academics, I did really well, you know, almost straight A's. On the comportment side, actually in fifth grade, I failed cooperation, obedience, and self-control. I failed it. I didn't even get a D. I still remember that nun. She had it out for me. Um, but I deserved it, and probably, uh, I probably would have been diagnosed now with ADD because I just didn't know how to deal with my emotions and stuff. And what happens is, as those kids grow, and in, in, in the ones with, with several traumatic experiences or even one, all of a sudden, in, in their, even earlier now, it's 12 or 13, you know, in my day it was more 15, 16 when people started smoking weed and doing those kind of things. But they turn to these things and all of a sudden it's like, oh, just like Mike said about his son, it makes total sense. That six pack to put out that fire in the brain absolutely makes sense, right? And so these kids who feel all these kind of things, all this emotional and psychological and terror and pain and utter sadness and shame and why does it, why was I rejected and why was this done? And that's not even, this isn't even conscious. All this stuff is just percolating. And all of a sudden they smoke a little weed or take a drink and whew, I have some respite. You know, it feels good just not to feel that, right? Okay, we're short on time, but you know, I'll, I'll do one trajectory here. So eventually they become habitual users. And, and what do we do with kids who start to use a lot of drugs, right? Get labeled or we, we judge it. That's maladaptive behavior. That's, that's aberrant behavior. This kid's going down the wrong path. He's hanging out with a bad crowd. He's becoming a bad kid. So not only do they have all these internal traumas and, and pain, but now we've shamed them. We've, we've just piled on. We're re-traumatizing, right? And so that person, right, again, they may, get, they may get help. If things start to deteriorate, they may get help pretty soon, and they get kind of in the system, and there's a lot of good help available, right? Or they may be able to function highly and, and move through, matriculate through school, go to college, grad school. Um, as, as Kim pointed out, there's, you know, there's addiction and mental health doesn't discriminate. Okay? And so one of the impacts that the kids, I'll use kids, that come up into the workplace, right, they're bringing all that with them, right? And if, if prior to that happening, the parents of that child, who's really struggling. Now, any of us that have kids, no, we'd do anything for our kids. Mike, what a, what a beautiful story. Thank you so much for that, right? And that affects us. I mean, I've had times where my kids were struggling, and I'd be at work, and I would, you know, I'm working. I can compartmentalize, but it creeps in there. It creeps in there. And you start to think, and it's what's called presenteeism, right? You're present, but you're not all right there, 100% focused on your job. And I think probably we've all experienced that somewhat. So those are, the, those are the two ways into the workplace that um, drug addiction um, and mental health issues impact. And I, and I would think that um, two of the things that we can really do to help our fellow um, employees or, and staffs, if we're in a, a position of leadership, is to create a climate of, of kindness and compassion. I, Mike talked about love. I like the loving kindness um, term. But to, to be able to, to um, facilitate that, and, and how do we do that? Um, in, in my experience, um, mindfulness, being present, being in the moment with the person you're, who's in front of you is a great way to create that kind of loving kindness, compassionate uh, environment. So, uh, there's no AFib going here, I don't think. Um, so at Miramont, over the last 12 years, we've had trainings of uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Anybody ever taken that course? Anybody familiar with it? A few, okay? So it's an eight-week course uh, developed by John Cabot's in. Um, it really is, it's really, he brought it from the East. It's Eastern meditation, but he called it mindfulness-based stress reduction. And 
and at the, um, at the UMass in Worcester. I'm from Boston. I can talk like this if, if I need to. Um, and he, when he called it mindfulness, mindfulness-based stress reduction, he said, "I got everybody from the, you know, the, the chief of oncology to uh, people that were, um, you know, in, in environmental services." Okay, so it's an eight-week course, and what it does is really helps us be in this moment and pay attention, awareness now. Um, most of us live kind of in our heads and we're thinking about the past, we're projecting the future. And what happens when we do that? Live in the past, it's kind of depressing because we focus on the negative things, right? If we're projecting in the future, we kind of worry about um, what's gonna happen. So we, we feel a little anxious, right? So we get anxiety up there, depression back here. Right here, it's perfect, it's perfect, right? It, it, it's the present moment, and, and it's real, and it's live, and we're connected. Okay. So I would, I would really encourage anybody that has a, has a position where they can uh, help people um, uh, obtain and go to mindfulness-based stress reduction to do that. Um, so, so creating a good work, work environment is, is really important. Um, I'm sorry. I'm a little short of breath. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, well, let, me, let me practice mindfulness. Take a deep breath. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very comfortable with the crowd. I don't know why I'm, I'm just short in breath. Um, so the other thing we can do as, as business owners, as business leaders, as senior management, is, is to get a, a, a really good EAP service. And, and Kim alluded to that a little bit. I'm going to move over to this side so I can see the, the screen. Um, First of all, it's a, it makes sense business-wise, right? For every dollar you invest, you get three to five back. There's some studies that show 16. I take the three to five on a dollar investment. And what you're doing is you're, you're, you're getting people, you know, again, there's a lot, just like rehabs, just like businesses, there's a lot of different kinds of EAPs. And, um, you know, you want one that's a full service, hands-on, present. Uh, Kim talked about People don't even know it's there. You want somebody who's promoting these services. You're paying for it. You're, you're, you're showing it to your employees that you care about them, that you value them, and that there's help available. Um, so, you know, sustain healthy, productive employees, promoting employee engagement that fosters retention. Another, the rest of the advantages of EAP services. Increased productivity, reduction of health repair claims, um, okay, we'll go to this one. No, <laughs> that's right. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Okay, that's right. thank you for that. Um, so these are the most common concerns and issues. Um, the first one is relationships, marital, um, just people struggling with their marriages, with, with their kids, with their parents, all those kind of things. And interestingly enough, legal is the second one, which oftentimes some of these first, that first item goes into divorce, custody, uh, those kind of things, uh, sadly. Um, and also just um, wills and all those kind of things. Financial, child care, uh, elder care, anxiety, depression, grief, stress, and addiction. So here's, here's a set, the, the counseling model session that uh, different organizations can get, three to eight sessions. And this is short-term brief therapy. And it's not even therapy. It's really just counseling. And oftentimes just a three, three sessions with an EAP uh, professional they can get right back on the job. And that's the whole point, is to get people back on the job healthy, happy, functioning well, productive. You know, the EAP um, started from the treatment industry, from uh, the alcohol treatment industry. And I remember as a, uh, a therapist three decades, decades ago um, doing back-to-work sessions with the EAPs, and they were specific to those uh, particular organizations, like DuPont in Delaware, Chrysler in Delaware, Philadelphia Inquirer, Luke and Steel, um, all the major trade organizations, PICA. So I knew all those um, EAPs, and uh, a lot of them are still around today and still uh, doing great work. Um, but all these different things that, that people are struggling with, um, you wind up uh, uh, helping, you know, directing people there. Next, next slide. Work-life services is huge. I mean, even, even down to getting a, a, a dog walker. Um, but all these things, like with elder care, for instance, my mom uh, died about six months ago, and she uh, had developed dementia, 
and I have a sister that's a nurse and a sister that worked at uh, Chester County um, uh, Office of Aging for 25 years. So they really took care of that. But I know if I didn't have those resources, I would have called the AP. It would be my first call, because I know what they could do for me and my family. Uh, next slide, please. Legal services, we can move on beyond that. We'll probably get through the slide. Financial services, go beyond that. Healthcare, obviously, is, is huge, trying to navigate the healthcare system. Let me go to the last slide, please. Oh, no. Oh, this, well, this is important, too. This is what uh, Kim alluded to when uh, EAP is, am I going to be in trouble? Am I going to be sent to them? And you know what? As a, as a middle manager, this was, this was awesome, to be able to direct somebody, mandate them, go get help. And oftentimes it works. You know, if somebody's just angry and hostile and they go take anger management and work with the AP, they come back happy and, and, and really uh, do well. Um, and this is just a, a note. In the industry over the last several years, um, there's been a trend. So if, if you're working with a benefits broker and they say, well, I want to sell you this disability uh, plan and, and product. They say, you know, you pay this amount, we'll throw in the AP services on top of that for free. Wow, sounds like a great deal, huh? You get what you pay for, right? They're not hands-on. You're not going to get the utilization reports. You're not going to have people promoting what the EAP services can do for your employees. So really take a look at this. And again, I, I would refer to the, the real professional in EAP services, but I know for 30 years on all different levels of dealing with EAP, how important it could be and how helpful it can be for our, our employees in the workplace. And again, it really shows that we're investing in our, in our greatest resource, which is our, our employees and staff. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to have Sean Rare from Rare Heating and Cooling, who's going to give us um, a perspective from both an employer and an employee. Oh, <clears throat> thanks for having me. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mary Beth DiVincenzo, DiVincenzo, I'm sorry, uh, Mary Kay Owen and Claire for inviting me out for the first time that we spoke. I kind of gave a brief history of my experience, and uh, so I was selected to come here and, and give an employer perspective, and then, uh, well, a little bit more than that. <clears throat> I'm not a public speaker, uh, so I figure I'll keep it simple, right? Let's start with existential questions. Who am I and why am I here? Right. So <clears throat> why am I here? Uh, if you don't mind, can whoever would, has been affected by an overdose death or an overdose, please stand up. That's directly, indirectly, family member of a coworker. Okay. And how about suicide? Anyone else? Thank you. We don't have a drug problem. We don't have a mental health problem. We have a people problem. Tom came up and talked about numbers. Did you see how many people were standing around? It's not about numbers. It's about people. We have an interpersonal problem. We have a communication problem. We're not getting the point across. Uh, <clears throat> with as many people who have been affected, that means that at some point we've all been enablers. It means that at some point we've all uh, turned a blind eye to what was going on in front of our face and uh, broke down communication when we were pretty much counted on to be there to offer it. I think if we treat it as a people problem, then we can get to the people who are really suffering and find a solution. It's it's pretty obvious to me, uh, being in the field that I'm in, what the patterns of workplace behavior are for people who are uh, suffering from mental health issues and substance abuse. You have the textbook issues you hear about all the time, mood swings, right? Uh, same thing with like your kids, you know? Like if they're having mood swings, you need to be aware and concerned and, and find out what's going on. Uh, missed time, you know, patterns of missed time, Fridays, Mondays, stuff like that. So uh, when, this, when this happens, 
you know, there, there's the time to intervene is, is right then and there. And when you decide to intervene, which I think is imperative, you have to uh, know how to support those people that you're, you're intervening with and for. And uh, I think with the mention of the EAP programs, uh, they're great for putting out the fire, right? Like if there's a fire in your house, the firemen don't come there and run around and send out an investigator and say, what's causing this fire? They get in there and put it out first. Then they send the investigator in there to find out what caused it. So putting out the fire, I think, is very important. Um, <clears throat> You know, for someone struggling, you, you give them a card, you talk about the EAP program to them, but that phone weighs 1,000 pounds. You can't pick it up. So, uh, you know, it, you have to, I think, understand how to get them into that program and not just hand them a card or give them a number. And, you know, if you don't say anything, you don't do anything, addiction is a progressive disease. So it's going to come to light somehow, somewhere. Uh, there was uh, some brief mention of peer support in the workplace. It's a difficult issue to tackle because, you know, you, you have HIPAA issues, you have uh, anonymity issues, you have people who are worried about, you know, having uh, repercussions. But we have to find a way. Um, I, I think mandatory education, like we have safety meetings. If, if you're going to have a safety meeting, you have someone out there to talk about addiction in the workplace, to talk about mental health issues, to talk about depression. You take 30 minutes of people's time, pay them through their lunch, and you talk to them about this kind of stuff. And when you do that, there's going to be a couple different people in that room. There's going to be those that are directly affected. They're in recovery. They get it. You'll have people that are struggling. They don't know what to do. But after hearing the conversation, it will, after hearing someone else speak, it may start the conversation, and, and that, that is always necessary if anyone's going to get themselves recovered. Uh, you have people who have a family member who are struggling, you know, and then you have some people with, with no point of reference, it's never touched their life, you know, just like uh, if you were going to give a safety meeting for a particular, a particular area of work that, that they're not participating in, well, it's just going to go over their head, it doesn't mean anything to them. And then you have the others that just say, well, the hell with them, right? Let them, let them die, right? And uh, you're not going to really do anything about those people. You know, they, they, uh, some people can be inspired to care, and some just can't. It, unfortunately, it ends up on people's doorstep whether they care or not. Uh, <clears throat> so as far as creating a peer support group in a workplace, it's very easy for me because there's only five of us that work together. So when something comes up, you know, we have a direct conversation. We can kind of monitor it. We try to keep it open keep the conversation open. And uh, I think it's, if for me, it doesn't have to be independent of the company because, you know, I represent the company. But in other cases, I think it's important to keep it independent of the company. So you have to create a peer support group. You have to have some oversight, but you have to keep it independent of the company because the people have to feel open and honest, you know, when, when they're dealing with these issues. And I recognize the challenge there. Uh, <clears throat> I think... Another important aspect are uh, punitive measures and accountability. You can't just keep telling people, you know, to get right, get right, stop coming in late. Discipline lateness and absences right from the door and equally across the board. Don't give a guy a break because, you know, he's on a dark team and he's coming in a little bit late one day, but then someone else comes in late and you have more of a problem with it. It's got to be consistent. I think, uh, I keep saying I think, of course I think. Uh, it, well, yeah, so whether they're suspected of, of uh, substance abuse issues or not, just keep the, the discipline consistent. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> keep the door open for improvement, right? It's, it, it's once people start having these type of issues, it, it's not a one-way trip, right? We, we, uh, it's, it's not always the case. There is recovery. There are plans for treatment, and they work. I think you just have to excuse me. Uh, you have to create a last chance agreement for people so they really understand that once it gets to a certain point, you have to just let go. You can't continue to enable. If someone's in active addiction, they're going to eat you up. They're going to take everything you give and then more. 
you're going to have to break from them. And with mention of love, you're going to have to love them from a distance. You can still care, but you can't keep paying them, you can't keep supporting them, you can't keep tolerating what they're doing. So last chance agreement. And if someone comes around after the last chance agreement, maybe you have an expiry period for that. If they have, you know, a year or two, and then they have another issue, and it's just a brief uh, relapse, you can continue to support them instead of showing them the door. I recognize that there's a disconnect between the program. When I, when I was asked to speak, I did a little bit of research. I called some people from EAP programs that deal with, uh, one of them is uh, for the Electricians Union Local 98, and the gentleman I spoke to within, you know, 30 seconds to talk to him, I could tell that he was really on the right path. And uh, I wondered why these resources are available out there, but why, and why are there so many people struggling, and why these people struggling don't understand it. If they really, if they get this guy on the phone, that's really all it's going to take. And I spoke to someone else who was dealing from the mental health aspect and administrated for the uh, Carpenters Union, it was the same thing. Uh, you know, a brief conversation, and you could end up, you know, in the right place. But, again, if that phone does weigh 1,000 pounds. Uh, as an employer, I think you have to be open and, not, and honest as well. There's a culture that already exists in the workplace that's conducive to uh, these type of behaviors. And I, when it comes to uh, people who are at the precipice, they are uh, predisposed to addiction. Something like a three martini lunch, or you know, a guy has some back pain, and a coworker says, "Here, I have something for that." That could that could spell doom for someone who's on the brink. And that has to change. You know, your supervisor, a supervisor's working for you. He would have enough sense not to suggest that everyone go out and kick a soccer ball around if there's two guys on the crew that have prosthetic legs, right? Would just make sense. But if you have two guys that are on the brink of alcohol, alcoholism, or drug addiction. Asking those guys to go out for lunch and have a couple of beers, they wouldn't think twice. I think it has to, we have to keep it out of the workplace altogether. And treat it as a disease. You know, like I said, someone may be on the brink. They may be impressionable. They may be looking for someone in a supervisory position for guidance. And when they're getting the wrong type, it could end up turning out pretty bad. We started with the why am I here, right? Get to who I am. Who am I? Uh, my name is Sean, and I am an addict and an alcoholic. I also had a complete breakdown when I was 24, ended up in a mental health facility for a couple of days. And uh, it's been a long struggle since then to get where I'm at now. Um, just say that it can be done. I... Uh, Spoke of parting ways when the time comes. Well, that's kind of what got me into treatment recovery. I had a colleague, I was a business owner at the time already, and I had a colleague who I was working with, and uh, I had hidden a lot of things from him over the years, and he found out what I was doing. And I never really felt like I cared too much about letting people down, except for this one time. You know, I let this person down, and it hurt. And uh, I had been hearing about the program at that time, 12-step program, and I thought, well, what do I have to lose, right? Obviously, I, I can't get this straightened out on my own. And I went, and I checked it out, and I thought the worst that could possibly happen was I would sit down, hear some stuff I didn't care about, and get a cup of coffee and leave, and uh, it ended up changing my life. We need the full participation of employers and a desire to see the full picture. There are free programs out there. There's Naranon and Al-Anon. Anybody can go to these programs. These programs are for family members of people who are in recovery or suffering through addiction. It would apply to an employer as well. You're not going to be excluded. AA and NA both have open meetings. You can get an app on your phone. You can go to any open meeting, check it out hear what they have to say. Sometimes you'll get some insight on how to deal with someone who's struggling. And you, there are some people, you know, in, in any group, there are going to be some people who are struggling themselves. And I think it's important to realize that it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and if you're going to refer someone 
to an EAP program or a mental health consultant, I think it's important to go through the whole program to, to see where the handoff is and what happens after that handoff point. The utilization report is great, but what, let's get it to a personal level. What, what is actually going on with these people? What's it like to sit in that chair, to sit across from somebody? What's it like to pick up that phone? Am I getting the type of personal, am I sending to some, someone to, to, to an individual thinking that they're getting a, a personal interaction with them and then I find out that that's not the case? And I wonder, well, what's going wrong? We're putting this money into the program, we're paying for it, we're sending people there. Why is it not working? You know, we need to find out where the disconnects are. And uh, if you have an employee in recovery who's, who's willing to talk and break their anonymity, encourage them to continue the conversation. And, and I think that's another way to create the culture where uh, you have, you know, just an open discussion about drugs and mental health in the workplace. This is a little bit of a conundrum, you know, the 12-step programs, or uh, dilemma, sorry. A little bit of a dilemma. The 12-step programs are based on anonymity, and addiction dies in the light of day. So some of us, in order to move this forward, need to break our anonymity. And I, I get a real sense of freedom from doing that. Have any issues with that. And we're supposed to practice in the program that, that I participate in, attraction rather than promotion. And the best way to attract people to uh, recovery is to, to turn things around, to live life the way that it's supposed to be lived. And, uh, and that's definitely the best way to attract people. And I'll just end with, uh, we do recover, there's hope. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Thanks for having me. So now we're just going to take a minute to transition and invite the panel up to this stage. We have a few questions for our panel. First, thank you for sharing your story. I would like to start with Tom. If you could, could you um, share with us maybe some modalities which have been particularly helpful in reintroducing employees back into the workplace? Well, you know, things have really changed since I talked about sitting with EAPs from the, the various businesses uh, coming back. And that was a, you know, we talk about warm handoff. That was a, a warm handoff back then. They would hand them in to me, I'd hand them back, they'd have a continuing care plan, they'd be getting urine drug screens, and it was a really a, kind of a tight, um, you know, back to work uh, scenario. Now it's a little bit different. Most of it's done um, anonymously. Um, if somebody's struggling with, with an issue, they may go, they may call the EAP, uh, they may just call the person who handles FMLA, right, family medical leave, um, uh, from, from, a, from the HR department. So people can, can access uh, services, leaving work for a while, and then coming back without management even knowing. Uh, we know they're gone, but we don't ask. We're just happy they're back and well in the workplace. So, but I, I, if, if people confide in you, you know, if, if, you have a, if you're a manager and a subordinate confides in you, I think, you could, again, just, just be present to them, encourage them, you know, um, work with them. It's, um, Again, it's changed a lot over the, over the last uh, 30 so years. Thank you. Sure. Kim, could you share with us a little bit about, you mentioned mental health, mental health first aid and uh, drug-free PA. Could you mention a little bit about what's in those programs and how they would be beneficial for the employers in the room? Sure, and there's a couple of different ones. Mental health first aid is like a first aid class. So if you had somebody that had an injury on the job, you have basic first aid. How do you patch up something? 
It's not supposed to be specialized help. We're, it's not asking anybody to be a counselor, but it, it explains a little bit about what does a mental health issue look like, what are mental illnesses, um, what are substance use disorders, what are some things that you can do that are helpful um, if you see somebody who may be struggling or questions, and what are some things, um, and then what are some resources for folks. Question, pers persuade, refer, and I always struggle with that one, QPR. Same thing, um, what are some questions, what are some things that you can ask, and, and, and what are the resources and the right next steps? Not to make anybody a counselor, it's really just to be sort of present and basic first aid. Uh, Drug-free PA, and I know there's some information on the resource table and somebody may be here there, but they do on-site trainings um, for employers, for employees, all kinds of issues related to how substance use may impact the workplace, as well as trainings for supervisors around how to recognize substance use disorders and then how you might need to document um, those, particularly if you have requirements around drug-free workplace, um, how to support employees around that, as well as review of employment policies around um, alcohol and other drugs. Great. So for uh, Mike Duncan, my question to you, how can you or could you give us some approaches that have been instrumental in preventing, doing some prevention work for your employees around drug addiction? Well, for, for us, one of the issues we have to be vigilant about same thing at Clare Shop. We've got all these drugs. We had a bunch of them. We administer them every day. And so one of the things as a healthcare provider we've got to do is have absolute tight control down to the last pill to make sure there's not some diversion going on. Uh, so there are audit trails in place. We know right away if somebody is diverting drugs. Uh, the other, the other is thing that we've done, and you hear some of the results of it among the uh, stats that you already saw, we worked with the different areas of the delivery system that tend to have more pain or narcotic prescribing. Uh, in orthopedics, we've reduced the number of pills prescribed by 35% in one year. And uh, our emergency room is very tight with how many pain pills they'll write. Uh, it creates a lot of conflict if you're running an emergency room, drug seekers, uh, that's one of the places they're going to go to try to get another prescription. And so getting that balance of mm -hmm. taking care of legitimate pain without uh, feeding an addiction is something that's part of our daily life. Absolutely. Um, DA Hogan, can you comment a little bit on the prescription monitoring program here in Pennsylvania and its effects? The, the prescription monitoring program has been really invaluable for us in cutting off folks who are seeking medication inappropriately because it allows the doctors to go in and check and see, are you doctor shopping and what other medications are you on? So it has really proved to be effective in cutting down the amount of abuse. Um, of course, at the other side of that, when you do catch somebody who is in that situation, the doctor has to be ready then to refer them over to get them into treatment, which has also proven to be pretty effective. Sure. So for you or for uh, Chief Gaza, has there been any um, movement on the legislation regarding, because we're so close to New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, tri-state um, information if people do go into another state to seek these kinds of illegal drugs or prescription drugs? So we are desperately trying to get that to cross over state to state. Um, so far it hasn't moved, but we are trying to get that legislation in place so that we can share it. We can share it right now across law enforcement forums, mm -hmm. um, but we cannot share it in general. And for you, Sean, can you describe for us maybe some um, initiatives or interventions you've deployed uh, with your staff in dealing with uh, addiction or mental health issues maybe that have impacted either or disrupted productivity for your, um, your position? You yeah, hold. as I stated before, we're a small company. So we have, as small as we are, uh, we've actually had two uh, opportunities to work with some people, um, and, and luckily uh, they, they had good positions and, and wanted to stay on. Sought treatment, and I think 
because uh, maybe because of my own history, I don't know. It, it, the environment is very it is more conducive to keeping them on the right path. Also, because of my own experience, uh, I'm a lot more aware and in tune, I think, to to what's going on and and ready to step in. So, when someone is in addiction and they find it easy to pull the wool over another person's eyes, uh, they're going to do that. And you know, we we uh, have the advantage not allowing that to happen. And I, I hope that that translates to larger companies as well. Thank you. Chief Gaza. And the numbers uh, for overdose in Chester County have really began to plummet. Is there one thing in particular or a million little things that you would attribute to that decline? I would actually say that it's not one thing. It is a uh, collaborative effort, not just uh, amongst law enforcement, but also with the public health side of the house and, and the doctors. Um, you have to take a, a million little things approach to everything. It's getting the drugs out of your home. It's educating uh, your children about the dangers of prescription drugs. Educating the parents about the dangers of the prescription drugs. Giving them a venue to get rid of them. Giving them a voice with uh, other organizations that talk about addiction and over opioid deaths and how that impacts the family. Um, and then working with law enforcement and getting law enforcement and first responders to buy in on the Narcan saves and the Good Samaritan law, um, getting other addicts to get people into uh, emergency rooms if they're overdosing and telling them they're, you know, that we will not prosecute you as long as you get that person medical treatment so that they don't die. So I think it's a million little things that are helping drive the numbers down. Great. And for DA Hogan, what are some of the ways that employers could get involved? It seems like you have a lot going on with the opioid task force, but what are some of the other ways that employers could be involved? Uh, they've got to observe first. Um, and this is something that we observe constantly. I mean, people talk about being a high-risk employer and worrying about your guys. We have over 800 cops in Chester County. We gave them all guns and they're just as likely to have problems with drinking and opioids as people in general are. So we really have to pay attention to what's going on with them on a day-to-day -day basis. But in addition to paying attention and realizing when somebody might be having a problem, we strongly recommend that you put in testing uh, and put in random testing. Most law enforcement uh, officials, uh, most law enforcement agencies do have it. Um, and anybody who is in a high-risk employment situation is going to have to put in some sort of testing because it could be anybody. And we have had cops who have been on the job for decades who we find out later had a serious problem for decades. Yeah. Tom, oh. given the nature and the sensitivity around treatment, what are some of the ways that employers can support um, the employees as they transition back? Well, again, going back to the, the last question, mm -hmm. it, it is, is creating a, a, a culture of acceptance, uh, non-judgment, um, and, and really that, that kindness and compassion, knowing that you know, we all struggle with things mm -hmm. and, and that uh, somebody who has left employment and gone for treatment or has been on FMLA for a little while, and you know, that's, that's one of the, the great things about FMLA. If people want anonymity and they, you know, I'm taking care of a loved one, or I've gone away for treatment, they don't have to say that. They just know that they've, they've gone out for a little bit and they're coming back. But again, the, the most we can do is be present, you know, and, and uh, just welcome people back. And, you know, I took the mental health uh, first aid course uh, mm -hmm. to keep my license up and I ran up mm -hmm. to Harrisburg. And one of the best days I've had. It's just really amazing how this simplicity of, of seeing a colleague that may be struggling and you say, hey, let's get a cup of coffee or, you know, let's go out to lunch, um, is really meaningful. So I, I think um, all of us can just be as welcoming and, and kind and open and um, you know, let people talk. Great. So now we're going to open up the questions to the floor. I think I have some microphone runners that will help us with that as we uh, take some questions for, um, from the audience. Hi, um, I've been involved with alternative medicine since uh, 1983. 
things like uh, massage therapy, acupuncture, meditation. Um, and since 1974, Lincoln Memorial Hospital has had a very successful drug uh, detox and uh, recovery program. And I'm wondering uh, what all of you think are, any of you who would like to address this, think are the obstacles to utilizing these techniques more? Because they're clearly effective for helping people to modulate their mood, reduce pain, we could avoid prescriptions. We could help children uh, learn to deal with their anxiety and depression and maybe avoid uh, antidepressant medications. Even for all of us who are older, we could avoid uh, other kinds of medications. And uh, what do you think are the obstacles to utilizing these techniques more in the prevention and treatment of uh, drug and alcohol abuse? Well, I'll take that one, because uh, you're not a plan, tell them. Because what you're talking about is what we do at, at Miramont. And we have for, I, I talked about the MBSR classes, that we have not only for um, you know, the staff at Miramont, but all of Mainline Health. We've had everybody from, like I said, dietary and EBS workers take that course to uh, board members from Mainline Health. And, and part of the, the key modalities of our program is mindfulness meditation. You know, we, we expect if we expect the patients to live in the present moment and do what they need to do to recover, we have that expectation for ourselves to be in the moment and to work through our own issues. Um, we do acupuncture for detox. Um, we do body scans. We do yoga. You know, yoga has been proven um, beyond any other medication that's been studied to be most effective in reducing uh, the symptoms of PTSD. I mean, there's a lot of books out um, about that. And so every day, People participate in yoga. It's not a yoga class with spandex and, spandex and lattes, okay? It's about the breath. It's about pranayama. It's about really helping people get into their bodies. I mean, when you think about it, most of us walk around in our heads all day, right? We're dragging our bodies around. And it helps people to inhabit their bodies and see where they carry their pain. A lot of trauma is carried in the body, and it's not unusual for people to when they're doing their asanas or their postures, to all of a sudden just cry because they've loosened up some pain that they hold in their body. So I think it really has to do with um, buying in, you know, to, I don't know if you said, uh, to integrative approaches. Um, you know, you, you using, you know, the, the wisdom of modern Western medicine, but also using, you know, century, you know, millennial old uh, practices that help people, people keep, healthy and well and, um, and just have a, just a whole different um, outlook on life, you know, through yoga and meditation and those kind of practices. You know, one of the things that has changed um, is that AA and NA used to be the sole kind of place for people to recover. You know, there's new things coming out, like in, there's a Celebrate Recovery, which is a Christian approach. There's Smart Recovery, which is a rational approach. And one of the things we utilize at Miramont is Refuge Recovery. And Refuge Recovery comes from um, kind of the Buddhist principles of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And it's really for people who are non-theistic, they don't want to believe in a, you know, a quote, a higher power or God. Um, it's a beautiful spiritual path for them to recover and stay in recovery. So I, I think those of us that are open to these and, and see the, the efficacy of it are, are doing those things. But I think some people are, they say, this is what works and this is what we're going to keep doing. Well, I, you know, I use it, so I'm going to, you know, but I, I think the resistance is from not understanding it, and I don't know if it's threatening or it's just foreign, um, and maybe because a lot of these things aren't, didn't grow out of Western medicine, that it's been, you know, 5,000 years. You know, these aren't new concepts. These have been around 5,000 years in the East, and uh, so, you know, reimbursements. I'm thinking one of the issues may also be um, 
you know, when you can integrate it into sort of a daily activity in a residential setting, you know, how it fits into an outpatient or a 15-minute session, you know what I mean, if you're seeing a physician or a doctor, and what's reimbursable. So depending on reimbursements, what's available for you, what will be reimbursed, reimbursed, will acupuncture be covered by your insurance? You know, so as we look at some of the reasons people don't get care, part of it is cost. So if it's something that's not covered, that would have an impact as well. And I, I would... Just to return to one theme, um, it's easy to get angry at the insurance companies. I do it on a pretty regular basis, to be honest. Uh, but I used to run one. And um, you know, I think it's important to realize health insurance companies are not in the health business. They're in the financial services business. And it's their job to take money from us and then dispense it on things that work. And the problem of getting a better commitment from the payers in mental health and substance abuse is the evidence is just poor. It's poor. I, I've spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on my boys. And uh, one of them has spent up to two years in a residential center whose primary modes were the modes you're talking about. And I would ask them, what evidence do you have for that? And they'd send me some like an article from Time Magazine about how it works. It's just terrible evidence. I mean, I'm an engineer. I need some data. I need some proof. And we just we have to get better as an industry at doing good studies, not eight people that we gave supplements to and seven of them feel better. That that's not going to convince the payers. So we need it. I need it for my boys. We need it for our community. We need it so the payers will pay for it. We need real studies with real results. Hi, my name is Kathy. I'm with Drug Free Workplace PA. And I just had a question about naloxone um, in Chester County. So um, in addition to um, being the education manager with Drug Free Workplace, I am the parent of a child who lost their battle to an opioid overdose. Um, and Narcan was not available um, you know, within a reasonable time for him. So we have been working with many employers across the state that are adding naloxone into their first aid kits and training their first responders. And one of the biggest questions we get from employees and the employers themselves are, is their county, um, do they have free naloxone kits available? Because generally they're about $148. Um, but so does Chester County, there were a lot of people that stood up here that had a family member affected by substance use disorder. So I'm just wondering if somebody could share where those resources in Chester County would be. Um, yes, our drug and alcohol department provides naloxone and they do it in partnership with our Department of Health. They actually had some, like a, I don't know what you'd call it, a naloxone giveaway day you know, where people could come in and I forget how many, um, they ran out and had to go get more naloxone. Um, so, and it's distributed widely to first responders, to places where individuals may come, treatment programs, et cetera. Um, whether or not, and I don't know what the stock is, but can find out how readily available it would be to all employers free of charge. There is a fixed amount that we have, but um, there could be some. I think there's, if you call Chester County Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, they can tell you where it's available. And because of making sure it gets distributed, it's sort of the Department of Drug and Alcohol in partnership with the Department of Public Health um, in how that goes out. And then, of course, there's a standing prescription that's been ordered so that anybody can go to a pharmacy and get it at any time. In Chester County, because all of our first responders carry it, um, you're never more than really about a minute and a half from having access to, to, to naloxone. And I can tell you the one I was using up here was a, an old one, but I've got a fresh one in my bag and one in my glove compartment of my car, and that's pretty much how everybody rolls in Chester County. So we're ready to go at a moment's notice. Hi, my name is John Carmody, and thank you for the panel that's being uh, uh, here today. 
Um, Sean, you were talking about open meetings, 12-steppers, uh, and uh, getting, uh, getting help. You know, I think that's the hardest thing for somebody to do, um, whether you're dealing through work, your employer, or even family or a friend, to admit defeat at that point that you need the help. And I think that stigmatism is, is the toughest part to get over in the sense that it's, it's okay to ask for help. And, and that's, that's the one thing that I think a lot of our uh, people, whether you're at work or in a community, it could be in a jail setting, you know, you have to ask somebody for help in order to get where you need to be. There is a cost factor, I, I realize that, but I think the first thing you have to do is ask for that help. And I appreciate the law enforcement also, because over the years I've seen uh, LEOs or uh, law enforcement officers offering that assistance to the community in the sense of they know what the issue is, but it's up to the person, the individual, in order to say, I need the help. And I just thought maybe you'd, you'd like to elaborate a little bit. Yeah, uh, it's difficult to get people to realize that they kind of uh, need to come to that on their own. One of the things I think you can do to encourage it is, we all say we don't care what people think, right? That's just a common thing. Everyone can say, I don't care what anybody thinks. Well, if you see someone and you think that they're struggling, ask them, do you care what people think? And of course they're going to say, I don't care. I don't care what people think. And you could counter with, and if you don't care what people think, then go sit down at a meeting because you already don't care what people think. It's the worst that could happen, right? What does the... If you don't care what people think, what does the stigma matter? If you really don't care, show me that you don't care, go take a seat. And if you can get someone to do that, even if they're not ready, you can plant the seed, and that's all it really takes. Thanks for asking. Hi, my name is Mickey, and um, my son is actually struggling right now, and he went to a hospital, and he was actually turned away when he admitted that he needed help. So my question is for Chester County, um, what is your, what, what is, what do you do when you have uh, somebody come in? Well, I think it's probably true of uh, the other hospitals that are represented here. One of the one of the issues in Chester County is we're we don't have a psych unit. We're a med surge hospital, so we're not in the behavioral health and substance abuse business. But when somebody comes, we do an assessment, and in that assessment, what you're trying to figure out is is there a safe handoff to the community? Do they need to be transferred to an inpatient unit? If they need to be transferred to an inpatient unit. You're going through a process of finding somebody that will either take their insurance and has an open bed or will accept the fact that they don't have insurance. Uh, it's a terrible process. I think it's the worst part of the healthcare system that exists. And um, I'm in our emergency room every day that I'm on campus because if I want to know how we're serving the community, that's the place to be. And every day I go down there, we got 35, 40, 50 people in the house. And two or three of them are going to be mental health um, or suicidal. And intervening with those folks and trying to get them to safe care is um, it's difficult. They're for, and I say this and it tends to irritate folks, but again, I'm criticizing us. Uh, Chester County has the worst access to mental health services of any place I've ever lived. And, and we've lived in 10 states. And it doesn't make any sense to me because you heard some of the stats. The resources are here. The income is here. But um, it's hard for a bunch of us that are trying to hire psychiatrists and other mental health profession professionals to find someone who will come to work in Chester County. I don't know why. And I'm disappointed that your child was not well served. And I'd be happy to work with you guys personally if, if I can help in any way. Also, there is. Um for the COPE team, which is um, for individuals who have overdosed, there is a team that will come into the emergency department. There is a peer on the team um, to try to do some outreach. That actually is 
just started about a year ago. A little over a year ago, it's been expanded recently to all of the hospitals, and it started with specifically opioid funding, so it had to go that route, but um, it's also now being expanded and looking at expanding it much broader than that. Um, but it's to have folks actually go in to provide information, try to engage the individual who has had the overdose to get them um, into treatment from there. Um, and that is a good process as well. I would just like to say, Kim, in addition to that, for the patient, if the patient doesn't want help, the COPE team will also reach out to those supporters. So we've seen great results where maybe the patient wasn't ready for treatment, but they did reach out and support the family, which I think was so beneficial in, in many of the cases. Thank you. Um, so my question is for Sean or anyone who wants to answer, just to piggyback off of this gentleman's um, comment. So we have um, a pretty small company. It's around 200 people, but we have um, eight offices and two HR people, and we're in the same office. So do you have any suggestions for just a general outreach to say, we're here. Like, I came to this meeting, and I am available to talk to any of you, because I don't know for sure, and I don't see any signs like you were talking about of Mondays and Fridays off and that sort of thing, just because we're, you know, all around the state. Yeah, do you have uh, regular safety meetings? Or do you have any other meetings where you bring people We together? actually do, yeah. We just started safety meetings about two months ago. I, I think you can incorporate it into a safety meeting topic, uh, yeah. invite a speaker in, mm -hmm. somebody who, you may even get someone in the company to step up that you know that, that has some experience, some personal experience. They may be willing to do it. And then I think to moving forward to make it a continuous process, not just one safety meeting and then forget about it, you know, mm -hmm. for six months or for a year. But to, just to create the culture, this way, with 200 people, you know, the chances are pretty good that there's a few people right. that are struggling. Absolutely. So I think uh, it, you have an opportunity to create that environment. That's a great idea. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Michelle, and I really appreciate everyone's um, different perspectives and stories. Um, it, it really is very impactful. My question is for Kim or uh, Tom, DA Tom. Um, just, I just moved up from Virginia, where diversion first efforts are alive and well, and, and uh, implementing partnerships between healthcare systems and providers and law enforcement. Are there, can you speak to any initiatives or future endeavors or how healthcare systems can be a part of um, some of the initiatives that you've got going, whether it's called Diversion First or, or something along those lines? Uh, sure. We are, we've, have developed diversionary courts for just about everything at this point. We've got mental health courts. We've got drug courts. We've got veterans courts. Um, we've got intermediate punishment. We've got accelerated rehabilitative disposition. There are, if you can come up with a diversionary court, we're probably willing to try it. Um, and the, the first assistant uh, public defenders here as well, they work very well with us and with our probation department, with all of our health agencies in trying to divert people. We actually, as a result of diverting people, have the only prison in the region that's under capacity. Um, because what we do is we send violent criminals upstate and nonviolent offenders stay on the street and go into treatment. Um, they call it the Chester County Miracle. They ask us how we did it. And we tell them it takes a long time a lot of money, and very persistent efforts to do it. Um, so it took years to do it, right, Nathan? Um, but we're there, um, and we intend on staying there. So if you have any other ideas, please feel free to come up and tell us about it afterwards, and we'd be happy to look at it. And we're also looking at, um, there's a national stepping up, and Chester County is participating in that, and that's about reducing the number of individuals with mental illness in our jails. Um, at any given time, we probably have 55, 60 um, people with serious mental illness in the Chester County Prison. And we're looking at everything from, you know, at the time of arrest, what are some of the things that can happen in those crisis intervention training happening with law enforcement? What are the resources to divert people to? And that's part of our struggle is really to identify those, for particularly for individuals who um, may be homeless, have some other issues. Um, we're doing some a data project now that will help us sort of see what that looks like in terms of people and the systems they may have touched pre-incarceration. Are we connecting them post-incarceration? Um, so it's a work in progress all the time. But as Tom said, we have a number of really 
um, I think 97 was our first drug court and everything has grown since then and our juvenile justice system has also done a tremendous job of risk assessments and diversion and really moving to community-based solutions as well. Um, so since I have the mic, I'm just going to take advantage of that. Um, I, I'm curious about partnerships with, so we've heard you know, people from different health systems. Are there partnerships in place so once that diversion takes place, you have a connection to uh, you know, somebody in, in another entity to say, okay, this guy, we, we just got him off the streets or he just finished veterans drug court, drug court or veteran court, and we're putting him in this system, uh, that, that direct referral process. I'm just curious about that. Uh, yes, there are developed relationships that run through um, both the prosecutor's office, the defense office, the probation department that have been in place and continue to be in place so that they are going to the same place recurrently. We have those relationships set up and everybody knows very clearly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to be happened. Now, we've got a huge advantage in Chester County in that a tremendous proportion of people have private insurance. Um, you go down to Philly, it's very hard to work this out because there's just a huge population with their poverty down there that they don't have any insurance. And you're going to the health care providers and you're telling them, you guys please foot the bill for this. Um, and it's hard for them. Um, so it makes it a tough cycle. We have a lot of advantages here in Chester County. We try to take every advantage of it. We'd like to thank you for attending our, our panel today. We'd also like to thank the panel for their presentations. If you before you leave, there are there is an information desk out here to the right that has the information that specifically I believe Kim's department brought with drug free PA. In addition, for those of you who have registered to attend the ITAG meeting, your meeting will start at 12 uh, 15 sharp, and the meeting room is located at the top of the staircase outside the room, um, and lunch is being served. So thank you, and thank you for your attendance.